Good afternoon, church. Good afternoon, family. Um, this is Reverend Cecil Williams. I'm Janice Mirakitani. And we are co-founders of Glide when we, with, and when we arrived 50 years ago. Of Glide as we know it today, okay? Because we know that Lizzie Glide started Glide in 1929. And I believe that she is smiling down upon us all, don't you? Because we are carrying forth the mission of alleviating suffering and empowering people's lives and helping people break the cycles of poverty and despair. Uh, you know, over these 50 years, I say that we have used the word change more than any word in the, in the dictionary. Because every moment, every time we created a program, every time someone came to us in need, we had to look at ourselves first, and we had to create change. And in our growth, sometimes we grew so rapidly, we thought we were going to implode. We thought that we might not be able to sustain the programs that had grown so quickly. So it required for us to change again and to look at how do we build an infrastructure that will support all the programs that we developed. You know, over the 50 years, we've gone from one program, I mean, one building, which is at 330 Ellis Street, which now has programs from the basement to the sixth floor, including a clinic, and, and the rooftop. Yes, we have a garden and the rooftop. And we have to now five buildings, which include three, three residences, three permanent housing residence buildings for working class families, homeless individuals, and mixed populations of elderly, recovering families, and uh, HIV addicted, HIV, AIDS patients, as well as addicted people and recovering people. So we built those buildings, plus we have an entire building for our family, youth, and child care programs. Um, so we've grown quite a bit. We've grown from a, what, $35,000 budget 50 years ago. I think that included his and my salary. To now we have having to raise $18 million a year. Um, so transition is something that is not unfamiliar to Cecil Williams and to Janice Mirakitani. We ourselves have had to go through ourselves many, many transitions and changes and growth and and pain and looking at ourselves and growing with the people because they are truly the ones who teach us who we must become, who we must become as bigger, better, more spiritual. The relationship between the foundation and the church, the relationship between service and spirituality has always been a very natural kind of marriage. It's always been a very natural part of what we do that spirituality is built into the programs and service is built into the spirituality that we talk about. Programs are the action, are the feet. And you know, now as co-founders, we, as we look into the future, I as an administrator basically, for much of what I've done at Glide, am concerned about sustainability of programs, sustainability of the values and all of, all of the core programs that we believe so strongly in and the manner in which Glide provides these programs. It's not just the programs that we provide, which include perhaps over 100 service entities. It is how we provide them with every single person in, on staff being seen as a potential leader and having embedded within them the values of compassion, unconditional love, and unconditional acceptance. And every, every organization needs great leadership as we look into the future. And I believe that we have a team, and we've always worked as a team, haven't we? Very much so. Very much so. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Most of the time. Okay, I had to grow into being from being, being voiceless to embracing my power, and he had to grow in from being all powerful to becoming a little more receptive. <laughs> it's called me. It's called mutuality. Yes. 
So I think we have a fabulous team paradigm, and we, we look forward to a fabulous team leadership that will carry us far into the future and are far into investing in the lives of people and then the people we work with, our volunteers and our community. And of course, part of that great leadership team is our senior pastor, Karen Olivito. <laughs> Co-executive director of programs, Rita Shimon. Associate Pastor Reverend Theon Johnson III. And Co-Executive Director Kristen Grauner Yamamoto. And they're going to take over, folks. The program, I mean. It's such a delight to be here. We, um, what you're going to experience, what we hope we can give you, is a taste of what we have learned being at Glide that has helped shape and mold and equip us as we look at Glide's future. And so that's what a good part of our time is going to be. We've, we gathered and talked about those things that, what are the top things we've learned? And um, we were gonna have a top 10 list, but it became a top 356 list. <laughs> and the bishop said we didn't have that much time. So we've, 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 we've lowered it a little, but one of the first things we want to do is introduce you a little bit more deeply to Glide by this video. We come on Sunday to receive spiritual nurture, but then what are we doing on Monday with the people who are sleeping in our church patios? What are we doing on Tuesday for the children who are latchkey kids or foster kids? What are we doing on Wednesday for families that are experiencing domestic violence? What are we doing on Thursday for people who are addicts? and alcoholics. So the church should be that place that is going to where human hurt exists. If we are to be truly people who transform the world. So, yeah. Well, I, you know, I want to acknowledge the trenches because I think the trenches is where the life blood of Glide comes and feeds also and tra transfuses us on Sundays because the trenches where Rita and Kristen spend much of their time, you know, we have an extremely diverse population. And Rita and Kristen, perhaps you could say something about that population because so many of the people we serve are rejected by other services, by other nonprofits, because we have the most difficult to serve population in San Francisco and the Bay Area. I mean, we have people who come out of prison. We have people who are dumped into the Tenderloin from prison. We have people who are dumped into the Tenderloin from mental institutions and from, you know, from behavioral difficulties, from the drunk tank to from families who are rejecting their kids. So we, we're dealing with human trafficking. We're dealing with people who are completely behaviorally out of control at times. So I, I think that it would be interesting uh, Rita or Kristen, for, to hear a little bit about what those trenches look like. Hmm. You know, I, I, I can always just speak from what, what comes up as soon as I hear something. And I, I was thinking about onward Christian soldiers, because I felt like I was in the trenches this morning and every morning. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to lay down my sword and shield. So how do those two things come together? Right. And, mm. and um, I think that, you know, we, in our work as soldiers in the trenches, we don't do, we don't have weapons of destruction. You know, we're not, we don't go forth to destroy, at least my perspective. I don't go forth to destroy evil, but I go forth to bring a new kind of tool, which is unconditional love and respect to the world. And, and that's important because the people that we serve often, when you look at them, they are symbolizing evil to so many people. When you look at a drug addicted person or you look at someone who's coming out of prison because they've killed someone or you look at someone who's just losing their mind in the street, uh, sometimes that, that, that represents evil to some people. When we look at that person, we look at someone who is human, we look at someone who has the potential to love if they are loved. I hope maybe Jan told the story earlier about uh, one of our, our, our um, people who, who said, 
I've been in prison for 14 years. I've killed people. I beat people up every day. I used to hurt people. Now I'm helping people. So when we look at the people that we see, we see human potential and we see love that happens. He says, I'm not a bad person. I just need healing. So the people that we serve are people that many of us think are throwaway people, but they're not. Kristen, I think it would be really um, helpful if you talked about some of the complexities that it requires for Glide to continue to grow. For example, the necessity for partnerships, and particularly now with the divide so huge between technology and those who have an enormous amount of wealth instantaneously at the age of 20, and the people that we serve in the Tenderloin who are enormously poor, and how do we, how do, what kind of partnerships have we been developing in order to bridge those divides? And, you know, nobody can do anything, everything by themselves. That's the reality. I'll talk a little bit about that, and then actually we're going to address that later on. Um, you know, Glide is not an organization that is fully funded by the congregation, which I think might be a new piece of information for many of you in the audience. Um, Glide is 25% of our funding comes from the government, um, and about 45% comes from individuals, and obviously congregation members are a part of that. We get another 25 to 30% from foundations and corporations. And what does that quickly add up to? So that's close to close enough to 100%. Um, and in doing that work, it's really a lot of uh, partnerships in the community and just, you know, with a number of services that we have. We, we throw around different numbers, but I like to think of the number about 30 programs within Glide. And many of those have multiple levels of services that are offered. But it's a real amount of work and a real amount of infrastructure to pull that off every day. Uh, the fundraising is no joke. Um, we spend a lot of our time fundraising and advocating to both, uh, we sent 15 employees um, and volunteers, both from the church and our volunteer pool to City Hall this morning to advocate for the budget, the final budget uh, draft to make sure that the services for people who are sleeping on the streets and eating meals at Glide and don't have access to health care are in the city budget and paid for. And um, that was something that we felt strongly about allocating resources to do. Um, but a fundraising department, uh, staff to do advocacy, uh, staff to just make it all work. Uh, we're getting asked more and more, particularly by the technology community, to really sh put forth results. And so it's a very different paradigm, I think, from where we started as a potluck meal into where we've grown to and where we see ourselves as we move forward. Um, but it's complicated and doable and uh, just requires a lot of different skills and personalities. I want to talk about the, the, the inclusive nature of Glide, what it means to be radically inclusive. I was at a meeting in Chicago recently of church leaders, and we were talking about a segment of the population that uh, we're trying to reach out to. And one of the clergy there said, well, I don't have to ask them what they need. I know what they need. What I love about Glide is we don't assume. We go to people who are in need and help and listen deeply, listen deeply, so that they can speak aloud what they need and be in partnership as we are agents together of human transformation and liberation. One of the ways, wonderful model Janice and Cecil did for us was when we were talking, when we realized that we were the dumping ground for the formerly incarcerated. And we were asking, How are we, what are the needs? And so we held a speak out, open mic for one hour. That hour has become one of the most important cornerstones of the week at Glide as people come and speak the truth of their lives. And from that, connections happen, relationships build, answers bubble up from the community. It's very powerful. And, but I'll never forget one man who came, he was clearly high, his teeth were clearly of one who had been doing a lot of drugs, and he looked at us, and the room that's usually a little chaotic just hushed, and he said, can I trust you with my dignity? And I was convicted. How often 
have I not offered dignity to someone because I thought I knew their needs, I thought I knew who they were, and I made assumptions. And so to be radically inclusive requires a whole shift in self and, and in relationship to others. So. I just want to add that the speak outs, which we hold every week, are really an, an offshoot of the recovery programs that we started in the 1980s when the African American, predominantly African American community came to us and said to Cecil and to me, help, crack cocaine is genocide against all the African American community. And the traditional AA programs and NA programs don't work for us. And so we started right there, didn't we, with the addicts themselves and created recovery program right on the spot. And you know, our programs always are started by volunteers. <laughs> we don't ask for money and then start a program. Being radically inclusive is a value at Glide, and we've done a lot of work in trying to articulate those values. And I will say this is the hardest one for me. Uh, and you know, even among this leadership group, I think the concept of being radically inclusive is really front and center. You know, I am, as Rita said, I rarely go to church, and I um, am not really familiar with even the operations of a church, and come from a very different background, and yet am welcome and in feel included, and have also grown greatly by being part of a group with pastors and, you know, the different skills that are um, up here, and that inclusion, I think, starts at the top. And uh, it's been a huge growth area for me, and I continue to be challenged by it every day. To that point, if we walk into our congregations, and the language is such that those who may be outside of the community would have difficulty to access it. It's one indicator of ways in which we might need to begin to work at looking at how we can remove the barriers that exist within our congregations, within our communities, in order that all people may access them. I'm gonna try something. Here's what I mean for example. Here's an example. The Lord be with you. All right, now you walk in to like somebody who's, you know, hopped up on LSD and say that, and they're like, that may mean nothing to them, right? <laughs> Kristen says, or me. <laughs> but to be able to make sure that in showing up and in our sharing, that everyone feels as if not only they have a place at the table, but as Dr. Olivito has shared, that people's dignity can be held intact and cared for by us is a great gift. And it's a part of our tradition. I think it's very difficult to be radically inclusive outside of you if you're not radically inclusive inside of you. And what I mean by that is that when you walk into Glide and if you stay there for any amount of time, you will be changed because you will be challenged to accept more and more of yourself so you can accept more and more of others. And so that's, that is a part of what you sign on for when you sign on to work at Glide. One of the core v values of Glide is, and something that we learn, is that we're all in recovery <laughs> from something. And Janice started to touch on that. I talked about it a lot last night, mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's what our recovery program taught us. I mean, our, we have many, many programs that uh, we started in the 80s when the crises really did confront us in regards to addiction as well as HIV AIDS. And none of the churches, I mean, I won't say none of the churches, many, many, many churches turned away people who were afflicted with what they called at that time gay cancer. And they shunned sons, I mean, sons and daughters were shunned by their families. Um, and Glide, again, started a, an HIV AIDS program with a volunteer who went to the hospitals and visited people, who counseled people who came to Glide, 
And the church provided spiritual solace. The church provided acceptance and um, unconditional love. Uh, recovery, we're in recovery, I mean, to me, recovery is that one has to discover who you are every day. And that really is recovery for me. I mean, I, as an incested person, for 11 years of my childhood, by a number of adult males in my family, carried so much anger and so much resentment, which I had to swallow in silence every day of my life until, I opened up, until it was opened up and I could give myself over to love. I didn't think I deserved love. And that was a real turning point for me. And every day I have to teach myself how to love. Every day people teach me how to love and how to change myself so that I can be open to their pain and so that I can be emp empathic to their pain so I can be them in that moment. This understanding that we're all in recovery from something has, has really been um, an amazing part of my growth at Glide. What I love about it is, one, it's the great equalizer because none of us has the answer. None of us has it all together. Um, for me personally, I, when I've sat in recovery circles and li because we, recovery is done in community as we struggle to be human with each other, um, when I've been in recovery circles, I have had my butt kicked um, in ways that most pastors don't get them kicked. <laughs> but what it has done is it means I can't hide behind my title, my education, my privilege as a white woman. Um, it has meant that I have had to go deep to my own wounds, to my own triggers, and in community, learn how to be whole and learn how to be fully present to the people around me. So I, I am so thankful that this is a cornerstone of Glide because I really think that we Methodists talk about we're, we're moving on to perfection. We're moving on to holiness. We're moving on to wholeness. And uh, this is one model that, uh, for me, um, speaks very deeply to my own spiritual journey. Another great gift in our community is one that has been spoken about. Hopefully, you've heard it and will hear it over and over again, that we are as many as we are diverse on this team. And at times, we may find ourselves grappling with the language and the lessons that we learn. And how many of you, when you saw that one, that we're all in recovery from something, may have thought, Ain't nothing wrong with me. All right, come on, we can be honest, right? Well, okay, she said I wouldn't have said that. But or when we think of recovery, perhaps we think, oh, I'm in recovery from substance abuse, or I'm in recovery from domestic violence, or I'm in recovery from you know stepping out of uh, prison. And immediately upon you know hearing those types of triggers and seeing those experiences, would think. Ooh, hmm, I wonder how connected I am and can be to those experiences. But we stop and really listen deeply and make space for the stories of others, as we say, to hear each other quite literally into speech that we are afforded an opportunity to realize that I am but the person across from me. Right? But by not only the grace of God, perhaps just a few trips and circumstances, right? Because I know a couple of folks are probably one or two paychecks away from being out on the streets, right? I, I get some amens over here, right? You know, where some of us have had close experiences. How many of you know someone who's struggled with uh, substance abuse? That's right. Yeah, we all have been touched by that. And I think that when we began to hear, when I've heard stories and been a part of these recovery experiences, uh, have had to also look deep within myself and 
and be aware of uh, the places where uh, the experiences of others and my own uh, shame and past may cause me to feel a sense of unworthiness and um, as if I may not have a space within God's economy. But the great gift, the good news for us is that there is a place for all of us. Amen? Amen. And that the gift of recovery is available for all of us. And that when we really show up, that we are able to witness that it's in our own woundedness and brokenness that we are able to be a source of life and healing for others. This one's really tough for me. I just said the last one was really tough for me. <laughs> this one's really tough for me. But, and I just, you know, I know that um, because I know this group so well, I don't know you so well, but uh, this is one that I, I after, today's my seven year anniversary at Glide. <laughs> and in, in those seven years, I have grown to accept this. Um, the language is not the language that I relate to, I, kind of to what Theon was saying around, to me it connotes substance abuse or fleeing a domestic violence relationship, something very specific. Uh, I certainly can buy into the concept of personal growth. I love what Karen said about the equalizer. Uh, when I go to recovery circles, I am just amazed by the hard work that people are putting in in that circle. I know I can be better. I always leave, oh my gosh, I could be such a better spouse. I better go home and work on that a little bit. Or I can be a better mother, or I can be a better partner to my team here. And so, I, yes, I subscribe to the, the work that's going on there, and it makes me a better person, and I know I'm growing. And as Rita said, everyone who comes to Glide whether they know it or not, will be changed from the inside out. Um, and, you know, and I guess we're showing our differences here too. This is a concept, or a, a, a sentence that I struggle with greatly. This is one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we say recovery, uh, we mean recovery of our full humanity. So all of us have something to do there. And normally when we think of recovery, we're thinking, oh, the victim needs recovery or somebody who's had something done to them. Sometimes, you know, when we get a little more expansive, we say, oh, the, the perpetrator needs recovery because, uh, you know, all of us are trying to recover our fullest humanity. Um, also, the bystanders, the bystanders, the ones who say nothing need recovery. Because, you know, we think, well, uh, I'm not going to get involved in that. Or I have the privilege of not having to think about it or do anything about it. But those who are silent also need recovery. We're all needing some form of, of expanding our humanity and being able to feel uh, what's happening to the other. Ooh, I got an amen. Yeah. <laughs> and a hallelujah. Another thing we learned is it's not about me. This says so much. <laughs> um, you know, this work, we all have hard days. I'll just say it. We all have hard days at the office and... Um, you know, we're in the trenches every day, and this work is bigger than any of us up here. Uh, we all feel very, very strongly about that. You know, Jan talked about sustainability. We talk about connecting with people as individuals, um, and it's not about any of us. Um, you know, it's not only about Glide, too. And I, I think for all of us who are entering into this type of work, whether it's the ministry on Sunday or services throughout the week, I think we're all part of a community. Uh, we're looking a lot at how we can be partnering in the community differently, um, both with corporations, government, I think other churches, you know, and so all of, I'm an MBA, and so I kind of tend to think in market type of thinking, but, you know, really looking at the marketplace of where, what, where we are and what the needs are. Um, you start with the people you're trying to help, you start with your congregation. 
Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's an ecosystem that we all need to be a part of. I, I want to address um, something I know a lot of you are thinking because you wrote to me about it. Um, I was a pastor, solo pastor for 25 years before I came to Glide, senior pastor. Um, and it took me nine months to say yes to come to Glide. Partly because Jan and Cecil are such big presence and needed presence, actually. But I really had to go through a time of discernment to say, did I have the ego strength to be there? Did I have the spiritual resources to be there in a way different than I've ever been in ministry before? And for me, to come to the awareness, it's not about me in ministry. And I realized how much my ego had driven me in ministry. And it's so easy to say, these folks have been around. When are they going to step aside? But instead to realize, here are two people who have done remarkable things at the corner of Taylor and Ellis, who built a community from 35 to 11,000, from virtually no money to an $18 million organization in partnership with a lot of, with a lot of people. And I learn something from them every day. Every day. I am a different pastor because of them. And I, I have to say I'm probably the healthiest I've ever been in ministry because it's not about me. It's about being driven and led by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is expressed in the trenches. So I, I, you know, when I see it's not about me, I, I often, when I'm someplace, you know, people say, oh, you're from Glide. You do such great work there. And I do. But the real work is done in the trenches by the staff. I mean, how does stuff get done? It gets done every day because we have individual men and women and however they want to identify um, really working hard and dedicated to making life better for themselves as well as for other people. So sometimes when I think it's not about me, it's because I like to think it's about the staff that's doing all the work. I'd like to echo that. I find myself so grateful every morning that I'm coming towards the, the corner of Taylor and Ellis, even, yes, even the wind tunnel. <laughs> and it's because we're able to celebrate those women and men and folks who identify however across the spectrum who are involved in making it happen every single day. I feel like a cheerleader. And I love it. I sometimes even think about doing cartwheels if I wasn't too, you know, clumsy. Because they, they really are our staff, our community. Really, it's together that we are the hands and feet uh, that share not only the power of unconditional love and acceptance, but really extend uh, the bandwidth that is Glide in the community. So it's a great gift. We want to, uh, we want to make sure there's time for your questions. So we're going to turn to Q&A. There's mics out, I believe. So you see, we are, we are pretty transparent here with our own differences and questions before each other, and we invite yours. Microphone one. Oh, I sounded so Episcopal. Episcopal, I say, oh, Bishop. <laughs> Bishop Alavita. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, if you know someone who needs to be in the recovery program, how do you get someone in your program? If you know someone who needs to be in the recovery program, they should just walk in the door at Glide and go into the walk-in center. That will be one easy access that you can ask someone at the front desk or you can go up to the health center. But uh, first floor walk-in center, sixth floor health center. Microphone one. Pastor, 
at Elmhurst United Methodist Church in the eastern part of Oakland on 83rd and Plymouth Avenue. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to Cecil and Jan. Um, I had several relatives as a native of San Francisco who um, benefited from your program, your AIDS program, who were African-American males during the 80s and the 90s when it wasn't a cool thing at all for us in the black community to talk about it. And so they found support there and that also supported us as a family and friend community to them. The other thing that I'd like to ask is, as a quarter time pastor, my other appointment is in an ATM position beyond the local church in a healthcare institution that cares nothing about the United Methodist Church, so I have to keep those two very separate. I'm wondering how can I, because I see a great field of mission work and ministry on the corner of 83rd and Plymouth, and I want to know how can I or what suggestions you might have so that I can find grant writers who are willing to work on a shoestring budget because as Theon said, I am but a check away from being homeless and our church doesn't have an uh, endowment program or backing or anything like that. We're just trying to keep the lights on and praise the Lord. Well, I, I think that the first uh, two years of my time at Glide, I had to learn how to write grants. Because when we started the meals program, again, we had no money. And it's a very, very good question. I think nonprofits, I think people who are very dedicated to mission, that the money part of it is very difficult. And I think it is time for us to demand, and I say demand in a gentle but yet assertive way, that it's time to demand those areas and those corporations and those technology companies who say, what can we do to help? to bring them to the table and say, here's what you can do to help. You can help us with technical knowledge, you can help us with grant writing, you can help us with how to resource and accessing us to the funds that we need to be able to do better outreach to save lives in the streets of Oakland or Richmond or San Francisco or, you know, Tuskegee, wherever. I mean, we need to reach out to people who have the ha who have and who can give more to the have-nots. And we need to bring those le that leadership to the table. I know that it's not easy to do, but I, I would say start with your city. Start with your city, because they owe it to the people and the citizenry of your city to help you, to, to access resources for you. I would call my mayor, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll talk to her for you. I will volunteer Cecil to call your mayor. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Take some people with you, always, always. Don't go by yourself because they you defeated yourself then. But take some people with you. Always take children with you if you can. <laughs> also, also take pregnant women with you. <laughs> Hear me now, hear me, you want to win, okay? And finally, take senior citizens with you. In other words, visible practice. When you want to make things happen, you bring a community together, the beloved community. Just a few people, you're, you're church people. There got to be some people in the church, right? You got to, well, take them with you. Take your church people. You don't have to not call or take people with you or challenge the people. Challenge them. Uh, just do that and see what happens. And then if that doesn't work, call Jan. 
<laughs> I think there are two sources of power which Cecil taught me a long time ago. And that's where you, the church, have the power, and that is people or money. We don't have money, but we have people. And guess what? Nobody, and call the press. Call the press. Because every single politician in the entire universe hates to be exposed, okay? So you've got the people, you can organize. If you need some support around community organizing, you get, you know, you just get the people together. They will teach you how. Yeah. They will. They will open doors for you as you open doors for them yeah. about how you can get together and strategize to get to those sources that have so you can provide more for the have-nots. The final point that we had in our slideshow today was about love really does transform. And uh, coming to Glide seven years ago, this was a new concept to me. I'm very much of a numbers and outcomes oriented person. and kind of starting with love or faith at the very premise or the foundation of the work was really hard for me to get my head around. Um, with that said, in seven years I've grown a lot and I truly believe it now and I will take it with me anywhere I go after this. Uh, and I think, you know, a combination of the numbers with the love is a story I'd just like to share about a, a man named Joe who's a well-known uh, face, I'll just say face, around Glide he, a uh, substance abuser, had been in and out of shelter and housing, and uh, we collect a lot of program data about the work that we're doing, and I happen to be doing a survey of, you know, why do you come to Glide? Why do you do this work? You know, and thinking I had a checklist of, I was like, because he wants case management, does he want housing, does he want a hygiene kit? All sorts of, you know, very outcome-oriented things. And his answer really caught me by surprise when he said, this is the only place that anyone's ever nice to me. And that wasn't on my list. <laughs> but it certainly spoke to me and certainly got my attention. And anyone who I think I tell this story to, it's very easy to, for that to get your attention. And it's also very easy to imagine how much more effective a program to keep Joe housed or to, get, to kick a substance abuse program a, a issue is going to be when Joe feels accepted welcome and loved. And that, to me, is Glide's work. That's why I've been at Glide for seven years. And I can't foresee any programs or work succeeding without it. <laughs>